of Economic Anthropology at the London School of Economics and International Director of the Human Economic <coughs> Program at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. Professor Hart will speak on Gandhi as a global thinker, anthropological legacies of anti-colonial revolution. Through my welcome note, I will briefly speak about my engagement with Professor Hart's work and then talk about the student community here at SAU. Well, as a young scholar, I believe that the advantage of intellectual pursuit is that you don't have to meet an intellectual to be introduced to them. So by extending this argument, I would say that my, my first meeting with Professor Hart was one and a half year back through anecdotes my supervisor, Dr. Malika Shakya, shared about him. So in this one, she spoke about how the mind of an intellectual goes through the messiness of data and conceptual categories to come up with that one term that makes sense, and with it, everything begins to make sense. She was referring to informal economy, a concept developed by Professor Hart in the 1970s. My little engagement came through coursework on themes related to economic anthropology and the Human Economy Project. C. Wright Mills once said, intellectual, cra intellectual craftsmanship carries no segregation between personal and professional. Professor Hart takes this idea further. He includes the political as well. His Human Economic Project calls for a new synthesis asking rich researchers and activists to take a position as a global South collective while opposing forces of oppression in the wake of socioeconomic crisis worldwide. Further, Professor Hart also urges to cross fertilize across intellectual traditions and not to sharpen those boundaries. This is particularly relevant not only to students of economic anthropology, but also across social sciences and humanities, and in a certain Lathurian way, if I may see, even the natural sciences. The vibrant student community of SAU comes from eight countries across South Asia, a region which is bound by commonalities as well as differences. But we believe resolution to differences can come from an institution like ours, where we begin to imagine ourselves beyond the parochial ties of the nation state. We, the students, appreciate this opportunity to listen to Professor Harp and Professor Bose and meet several <laughs> distinguished scholars and members with whom space. Without further ado, I now hand over to Professor Sasanka Pereira, who will give us some background on the lecture series. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, that was Humut Bansali from our PhD program. <clears throat> and I always have regard for people like Humut, uh, who could have gone to any PhD program, because after all, we are not a you know, uh, tested or labeled uh, PhD program, but uh, you know these are people who had other choices who came to us, and I hope they are happy. Uh, Professor Hart, Professor Bose, uh, thank you for accepting our invitation and being here. Um, colleagues and friends, uh, good evening, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Um, basically, the the lecture series uh, that we call. Um, contributions to contemporary knowledge we initiated in 2012, I think, 12, no, 13. Uh, so we started with Professor Garanato Beseka from Princeton, and then in the 2014 we invited Professor S.D. Mooney, and then this is the third, uh, in which we are going to listen to um, Professor Hart. So it seems to me that we are going to engage in a fairly serious intellectual reflection through this uh, talk. But to provide some non-academic context to this, let me make a few personal comments on why we opted to feature a lecture on Gandhi in this continuing series of annual lectures. As, a, as an eternal cynic I know quite well, with no known reservoirs of wisdom and even lesser common sense, ask me in an email, after seeing some of our internet-based advertisements of this event, why are you people talking about Gandhi? You are not an Indian institution. True, South Asian University is not an Indian institution. At least in principle, we surpass the boundaries of nation states. We are simultaneously Afghan, Bangladeshi, Bhutanese, Indian, Maldivian, Nepali, Pakistani, and Sri Lankan. 
we epitomize the sense this collective can ideally mean, while we also reflect the nonsense we often live by in this region. But for me, that question couched within the narrow confines of the nation's imagination is irrelevant, particularly when talking about someone like Gandhi. In my childhood in the early 1960s, my father brought home a small bust of Gandhi from somewhere, which became a central point of reference and over time a taken for granted presence in our home. My father could easily quote some of his better known aphorisms and explain to us as we grew up <coughs> their contemporary relevance. When I got married somewhere in the late 1980s, my father-in-law gifted me a statue of Gandhi which he had inherited from the time he visited Sri Lanka in 1927 for three weeks. And I knew that he had also visited my school during those three weeks. When he gifted me the statue, he, he spent half an hour to explain to me how Gandhi made sense for contemporary Sri Lanka and how his ideas also made sense in the context of the Buddhist ideas which guided him. He noted with a sense of sadness that we had begun to forget both Gandhi and the Buddha. But then, this was not India, it was Sri Lanka. Gandhi was omnipresent in Sri Lanka in terms of his ideas and inspiration. He was in our textbooks. He was part of the local law. Everyone knew him. He was taken for granted of and often referred to and equally as often forgotten. <laughs> However, despite his central location in the Indian freedom struggle, he was not clearly seen as Indian, just as much as the Buddha was hardly seen as Indian or Nepali by anybody. Gandhi was simply Gandhi as the Buddha was Buddha. Thoughts of nationhood, citizenship and so on played no part in that imagination. Some of these historical figures like Gandhi and Faiz Ahmed Faiz closer to our own times and the Buddha much earlier had the ability to transcend boundaries of kingdoms, nation states, linguistic and religious communities, regions and temporalities in terms of their ideas and ability to inspire. These ideas became a part of the collective imagination at various times, not just in India, but also in Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and beyond. Though I hesitate to use the word South Asia, these kinds of people had considerable influence across the region in their lifetime and after. Gandhi, perhaps more so than anyone else in recent times. But in 2012, I heard of this unbelievable news that a statue of Gandhi in eastern Sri Lanka, which had withstood the vagaries of civil war, had been vandalized by beheading, beheading out of all things. Finally, in the context of India's diplomatic actions against Sri Lanka, the former Sri Lankan regime at the UN's Human Rights Commission, it appeared that vulgar and limiting nationalism, notions of nationalism, had caught up with the earlier imagination of Gandhi, which had no references to such boundaries. Suddenly, it appears, at least in this specific context, Gandhi had become Indian. Or, more accurately, he was equated with the Congress Party government of the time. That is, the unenlightened question, which I referred to at the beginning, emanates from these changed circumstances. But I hope these are passing and isolated moments. What I've tried to outline is the manifestation of Gandhi in a specific South Asian neighborhood beyond India. I assume that the political relevance of Gandhi to contemporary South Asia is self-evident. In his recent book, Terra and Performance, Professor Rustam Barucha deploys Gandhi to think about how he unleashed his nonviolence in a world of terror, violence, and cruelty. He correctly describes Gandhi as the world's most obstinate and visionary of radicals. For Barucha, Gandhi was not a source of solutions, but a catalyst and initiator of questions. It seems to me that anywhere in South Asia today, the most reasonable way to deal with evolving and often unenlightened politics is to follow Gandhi in his characteristic obstinacy as long as the goals he set are reasonable and sensible. In this context of Gandhi's presence, transgressing older and more recent boundaries in our region as well as epochs, when Professor Hart suggested that he would like to present his thinking on Gandhi, it appealed to us. 
We were curious to know how a scholar known for his work on human economy might see God. And here we are. Let me conclude by very briefly introducing Professor Shubhatur Bose, who will chair today's lecture. Professor Bose is the Gardiner <coughs> Professor of History at Harvard University. Among many other things, he was also the founding director of Harvard South Asia Institute. Uh, he had, we had specific reasons for asking him to chair today's session, just as much as we had specific reasons for inviting Professor Hunt. His scholarly interests in exploring colonial and post-colonial political economy and trade and imagination across the Indian Ocean made us think he would be an ideal person to chair today's lecture. That is, on one hand, these areas intersect with Professor Hart's regular interest in human economy. But more importantly, his work also intersects with the Faculty of Social Sciences' long-term interest in the histories of South Asia at a time our own university displays an undue and unhealthy fear of history. That is why we don't have a department of history. <laughs> that is why we are not planning to have a department of history. Unfortunately. Not a personal mission, but anyhow. Professor Bosa's many publications include The Hundred Horizons, The Indian Ocean in the Age of Global Empire, published in 2006, Modern South Asia, History, Culture, and Political Economy, written with Aisha Jalal and published in 2011. And his majesty's opponent, Subhash Chandra Bose, and India's Struggle Against Empire, published in 2011. So, Professor Bose, my ritual obligations are over. I would like to invite you to take over the process. <coughs> Dean uh, Shashanka Pereira, Professor Hart, a very warm welcome uh, to you. I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Malika Shakya for all her efforts in organizing uh, today's event, uh, and um, Umut Bhansali, uh, who uh, has given an introduction uh, to Professor Keith Hart, which I would not be able to emulate. We are uh, meeting this evening uh, on the eve of uh, the day of Mahatma Gandhi's assassination, his martyrdom. And tomorrow morning, uh, I will be going to Rajghat to pay uh, my own personal respects, along with all of the peoples of South Asia and the world. I think, as I greet the students of South Asia University from the eight countries of the subcontinent and beyond, I would like to remind them about <coughs> Gandhi's last few months between independence and partition on 14-15 August 1947 and his death on the 30th of January 1948. Mahatma Gandhi was not in Delhi on Independence Day. He chose to stay away from the celebrations, having failed in his last ditch efforts to prevent a tragic partition along religious lines. When the date 15th of August was announced as the day when India would become a free dominion. We did not become a republic until the 26th of January of 1950. Gandhi had wanted to spend that day in Noakhali, in Eastern Bengal. He had, of course, gone to uh, Noakhali and to Bihar in late 1946 and early 1947. But once he reached Calcutta, he found that he needed to be there to make sure that sanity returned to the premier city of India of those days. So just imagine, had he been able to keep his original plan, Mahatma Gandhi would have been in Pakistan on the day India won independence. But of course, he chose to live in a Muslim neighborhood, Belaghata, in Calcutta, and thanks to that one great soul, there was peace and camaraderie 
in the city of Calcutta in and in Bengal in mid-August. And that was, of course, about the time when Punjab exploded in violence, once Radcliffe's decision about the partition lines became public on the 17th of August, 1947. Gandhi was very proud in late August, 1947, when he saw the flags of India and Pakistan flying together in the city of Calcutta. Calcuttans, of course, relapsed into violence for a few days in early September. Gandhi had to resort to yet another fast. But then he was able to leave Calcutta and come to Delhi on his way, as he believed, to Pakistan, to Punjab. But he found that Delhi had been turned into a city of the dead. So he had to remain here in late 1947 and early 1948. On the 12th of January, he undertook his final fast in order to bring about a reunion of hearts among communities that had been split asunder by the partition. As a response to his fast, the government of India, headed by Jawaharlal Nehru and Vallabhai Patel, decided on the 15th of January to release rupees 55 crores as Pakistan's share of the assets that had been withheld because of the outbreak of hostilities in Kashmir. Zafrullah Khan, Pakistan's foreign minister, was then at late success. And he told the United Nations Security Council that a new fervor was sweeping across the South Asian subcontinent because of Mahatma Gandhi's fast. And there was a new spirit of friendship. And Gandhi had hoped that such friendship would replace the enmity of recent months. And it was only after getting assurances from the leaders of all organizations that they would address the problem of violence through genuine commitment and goodwill, that he agreed to end his fast on the 18th of January. And there were, of course, Japanese verses, as well as Hindu, Muslim, Parsi, Sikh sort of um, religious texts uh, that were invoked on that occasion. And there was also the great Upanishad King, Om Asatoma Satkamayo, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamayo, Nritor Mamrita Gamayo. On 23rd January, Gandhi was very glad to take note of the birthday of Nitaji Shuhashchandra Bose. He said he normally didn't remember such dates, but he made it a point to make a statement on that date. Even though, as he put it, he had been wedded to non-violence, while, as he put it, quote-unquote, the deceased patriot, whom he had called a patriot among patriots, had undertaken an armed struggle for freedom. He showed how Shubhashchandra Bose had a cosmopolitan vision that enabled him to rise above, transcend, without denying provincial and religious differences. That was the way to achieve unity. And that was why Gandhi felt Netaji was able to evoke affection and loyalty among his followers of a kind that perhaps, as he put it, no other contemporary leader could. On the 26th of January, which for Gandhi's generation was Independence Day, not Republic Day, once again Gandhi made a plea for goodwill among all of the different communities in Delhi. The following day, he visited the Chishti Shrine in Mehrauli. He was dismayed to find that the beautiful marble screens had been damaged during the violence that had taken place. And since he had spent some time in Bengal in recent months and had started learning Bengali, on the morning of the 30th of January, he did not forget to do his Bengali writing exercise. Even though he had many other important tasks at hand, he was trying to rewrite a constitution for the Congress party that would be suited for the post-independence period. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, when the news spread of the assassination in the evening, 
and I'll be personal here, the stories that I've heard from my father and my mother. Uh, my uh, mother was a 17 year old and she was attending a wedding of a, a, an inter, uh, you know, regional wedding of a Malayali groom and a Bengali bride when this news came. And at first everybody thought it was a rumor, but then gradually all the guests departed and the fall of gloom descended on the gathering. And once my mother went home, she tells me, she switched <coughs> on the radio, and there was a song playing, a Tagore song, Shomukhe Shanti Barabar, you know, an ocean of peace in front of us, sort of as the great soul made his journey across the ocean of perpetual peace. And what my father told me was what Sharad Chandra Bose, Netaji's elder brother, said, when he heard of Gandhi's passing. He, was, he loved Shakespeare and English literature as much as he hated British rule in India. And so he quoted Shakespeare to say, when come such another, if ever another. As I said, Kumut has given a wonderful introduction to the work of Keith Hart. We share an alma, a, a place where we have been, which is Cambridge University, which is why a common <coughs> student felt that he had to bring us together today. I would simply say that as an anthropo anthropologist who has written on money, I cannot think of anyone else who probably has the stature of a George Simmel of more than a hundred years ago. And especially if you look at his work on the flows of money, you know, across the oceans, the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. But at the same time, Professor Keith Hart has been writing about language. If you look at his book, The Memory Bank, it, it is about money and language. <coughs> and I think he is making a fascinating contribution to the history of ideas, particularly the global circulation of ideas. I think you will be treated to a real intellectual feast in the 50 minutes to follow as uh, Professor Hart tries to establish Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi as perhaps the finest intellectual successor of Immanuel Kant. But he will also link Gandhi's thought to Karam's that we see uh, among the African diaspora or intellectuals who are often regarded as pan-Africanists, including W.E.B. Du Bois, Franz uh, Fanon, uh, uh, and C.L.R. James. So it's going to be a very bold intellectual move on the part of Professor P. Hart today. Uh, I will leave my conversation, a brief conversation with him for, the, uh, for a little period after he has delivered the lecture because I'm sure we would want to explore the ways in which the cosmopolitanism of a Mahatma Gandhi may have been subtly different from that of Immanuel Kant, the Kant's cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism derived from abstract reason. But without further ado, with my, uh, with having invoked Mahatma Gandhi on the eve of his uh, martyrdom, may I now invite Professor Keith Hart to deliver his lecture. around the stage and wave my arms and engage with me physically, but today it won't be like that. Um, my lecture has six parts. Uh, I begin with the anti-colonial revolution and its relationship to world society. I then develop a, uh, the notion of an anthropology derived from Immanuel Kant. In my next section, I will look at three uh, exemplary Pan-Africanist thinkers, 
uh, W.B. Du Bois, C.L.R. James, and Franz Fanon. Uh, then finally, and probably too briefly, um, I turn to Gandhi and his anti-status vision of politics, uh, followed up by what would be one of the key ideas, uh, which is how can we uh, uh, bring uh, the world we live in uh, to a level uh, that our puny selves can uh, make a, a meaningful connection to it. And that, I believe, is also something to which Kennedy brings uh, tremendous insight and possibility. And then uh, I will end uh, with some reflections on uh, anthropological visions of world society. I'm very grateful to uh, uh, Sudan Bose for uh, pointing out that actually my main preoccupation is money. Uh, I, I study the economy in the most inclusive terms and that has developed recently in, uh, towards developing uh, the idea of a human economy uh, and one of the things that interests me about money is that it is one of the most inclusive uh, means that we have of spanning the gap that I've already uh, referred to. My uh, main professional work uh, has been uh, on the African diaspora um, and uh, uh, that's, I've lived and worked in uh, Britain and France, and Canada, United States, uh, Jamaica, Ghana, and latterly South Africa. But I've always had a, a, a sort of unconsummated passion for India. Uh, and uh, 20 years ago, um, I uh, was able to take up a, a temporary a partial residence in Durban in South Africa. And one of the main, re well, the main reason for uh, uh, being in Durban was that it provided the bridge between my concerns with Africa and the African diaspora and India, because being the largest Indian city outside uh, South Asia. Uh, my principal reason for going there was Gandhi. I mean, I, 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 uh, he'd always been a romantic figure to me, and uh, I wanted to have a chance to explore the two decades that uh, he spent there, and I uh, have. Uh, and so this lecture is, um, uh, I mean, it's inspired by and motivated by Gandhi, uh, but it uh, expanded in a certain direction to provide much more context because I wanted to show as concretely as I could the claims that I would make for Gandhi as a global thinker and for his uh, uh, connections with uh, the anti-colonial movement more generally. Now, it's not long ago, I mean, just after the Second World War, that, that there were several models of humanity and world society in circulation. Now it seems there is really only one. Uh, and we also know that it doesn't work. So uh, my talk today is uh, motivated by uh, a question, which is how can we think more uh, creatively about the emergent world society that seven billion of us are uh, involved in, uh, 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 in this planet. We desperately need, I think, uh, new visions of world society, but where to look? And uh, my argument is that world society was created by the European empires uh, of the uh, 19th century, which brought the world's peoples under the dominion uh, but the, especially in the middle 20th century, uh, uh, the world took another uh, 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 direction when those people coerced into European empire sought to establish their own independent relationship uh, to world society. 
And so uh, I believe we may be entering the third phase uh, right now, which I will say nothing about. But uh, in this talk, I will argue that, uh, for me at any rate, uh, the most uh, luminous uh, 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 inspiration that one can have in thinking in alternative ways about world society uh, comes from reading and learning from the great intellectuals of the anti-colonial revolution. I mean, these intellectuals uh, essentially created a, a vision of the world that rejected a notion of it as being based on a racial hierarchy of the kind that was put in place uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and so, as I've said, what they were looking for uh, was a way of uh, developing an independent relationship to world society, past and beyond European uh, uh, empire. Uh, now, uh, the leading intellectuals of the anti-colonial revolution then, uh, it seems to me, offer many uh, inspiring examples of uh, uh, how to think about the world in uh, different but also in holistic ways, uh, but uh, uh, none of them, uh, I believe, was more important than Gandhi. Uh, my, the framework of my lecture is very much shaped by the philosopher Immanuel Kant and the vision of a cosmopolitan society, world society, that he developed in the late uh, 18th century. Uh, there are a few uh, 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 thinkers uh, that could be said to have followed in his footsteps, although, for example, my discipline, anthropology, has uh, rejected and ignored uh, everything that uh, Immanuel Kant wrote about anthropology, including the first academic treatise on the subject. Uh, but rather than uh, 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 deal with Gandhi alone, uh, I would like here to juxtapose him, as has already been advertised, with some of the prominent Pan-Africanists. But first let me uh, say what I take from Kant uh, as an anthropologist. But I think that anthropology, although it has become mired in academic specialism and fragmentation, uh, is probably indispensable at one level to conceptions of humanity as a whole and the world society that we uh, seek to make. Uh, my mentor uh, is a Trinidadian revolutionary uh, who died in the late 1980s, C.L.R. James. Uh, I say mentor because I think I learned more from him than anyone else. I'm actually wearing his tie. This is a tie produced by the Pan-African Congress of South Africa, which was and is a revolutionary antidote to the ANC. And the tie has little uh, golden radiant uh, 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 images of Africa with the sun shining out of Ghana, the first African country uh, to uh, achieve independence from uh, empire. And James, uh, 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 one of the things, many things that he said that, that, that inspired me, he said the distinctive feature of our age is that mankind is becoming fully conscious of itself. And this is really the project that, uh, uh, that engages me. Clearly mankind is not in most practical senses, uh, fully aware of itself as an entity. In fact, quite uh, divergent uh, trends for human interaction are um, more prominent. Uh, nevertheless, it is my view that, uh, 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 that if we, you know, unless the 21st century breaks with the murderous pattern of the 20th, there won't be a 22nd. And that requires us, therefore, to develop uh, more effective and constructive and inclusive <coughs> notions 
um, of the world as a whole as we live in it. So for me, anthropology is nothing like uh, the academic discipline. It's a vision of where uh, uh, human development might be going. Uh, and it's something which many people have, including all uh, uh, the authors that I'll be referring to today. Uh, now, one of the, I mean, now, I think one of the reasons we have difficulty in making the personal connection to uh, humanity conceived of as a whole is that modern social thought uh, typically uh, puts emphasis, uh, privileges, uh, a, a bewildering variety of social divisions, associations and identities as being key and crucial to mediating that relationship between each of us and the rest of humanity. Uh, the question that I pose, however, is how does each of us relate to the whole of humanity? What are the methods available to us? What are the divisions? Now, uh, Immanuel Kant, um, uh, uh, in the preface uh, to the Critique of Pure Reason, which is his breakthrough philosophical work, uh, claims that he has made a Copernican revolution in uh, metaphysics, which is to say that, that Copernicus, uh, uh, instead of having the, 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 the planetary bodies uh, circulate around us, uh, uh, had us circulate around them. And Kant's Copernical, uh, Copernican revolution is, I think, of extraordinary significance. And I've got the, the, the quote from the preface here. He says, Hitherto it has been assumed that all our knowledge must conform to objects. But what if we suppose that objects must conform to our knowledge? Uh, and uh, this reflects what I'll be developing in this talk, which is that there is a world out there that we have to know about, uh, but at the same time, the world is something that each of us uh, creates subjectively out of our experience. And the, the principal task is uh, to see how we can imagine worlds that conform to uh, that subjective uh, experience. So the world or society in general is inside each of us as much as it's out there. What we have to break with is the idea that all the important stuff is out there and not in here and that we have to understand the logic and functioning of what's out there uh, and adapt to it in some way. Uh, Kant also believed, which uh, is uh, quite remarkable, um, that reason in humanity is uh, uh, only fully developed at the species level and not at the level of, individuality, uh, of individuals. He believed that the rationality that each of us has is uh, impoverished and, and narrow uh, and that what we have to do is to build means of thinking together. And this is not uh, an abstraction. Uh, for example, libraries are one way in which we pool uh, human knowledge. And the internet uh, and its associated devices have uh, 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 brought a new infrastructure through which we might think about uh, bringing uh, human reason into some uh, relationship. Now Kant uh, 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 formed his cosmopolitan philosophy around uh, four questions. Uh, the first one was, what can I know? That's uh, metaphysics, is the answer to that. The second question was, what should I do? To which morals is the answer. The third was, what may I hope for? Which he considered to be the motivating question for religion. And then finally, there is the question, what is a human being? To which the answer is anthropology. And he argues that 
uh, the first three of these relate to anthropology and might even be subsumed under it. So for Kant, uh, anthropology is the practical arm of moral philosophy. It's not moral philosophy. That's not where morals come from. But it is concerned with people's motives for action. Uh, the moral motivations they may have uh, for doing what they do. That's what he claims anthropology ought to be uh, mainly about. Um, now, just to step back from Kant and, and, and take a brief shot at the world we're living in, one of my uh, ideas, hypotheses, is that the world we're living in is no longer a, a capitalist world, uh, but this has in fact reverted uh, to the old regime that preceded capitalism, uh, an old regime based on uh, uh, political accumulation of rent rather than the pursuit of profit. And the result of this uh, new global old regime is that a very privileged minority inured to unimaginable luxuries uh, seeks somehow to distance itself uh, from and exclude uh, the young, darker, poor masses that make up the majority of humanity. So one of the, the, the chief uh, uh, sources of, uh, um, uh, of, of thinking about world society uh, today is that we have to uh, reconsider how uh, 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 inequality has been reconfigured since the days of um, empire. Kant uh, believed that uh, uh, the aim that we should be seeking for is self-knowledge as individuals and the species, but he also believed that the only means of achieving that is building a just world society, which he also thought was the most difficult thing uh, facing humanity. The whole project is essentially a campaign against alienation. In saying that what we need, that we need to feel more at home in the world, and that requires, uh, uh, amongst other things, freedom of movement, movement as a human right. So, if you ask, what is a human being? What to be human? Uh, we have to combine two things that we often find to be difficult to combine. One is we have to be highly self-reliant. What I call uh, uh, the toothbrush syndrome. I mean, who's going to brush your teeth unless you? And this applies to a vast amount of the things that we engage with in daily life. But it also requires us as a human being to belong to others in mysterious and often quite complicated ways. Finally, I would argue that we have to be quite explicit in recognizing that recent developments in communications technology have brought us to the point where we now have universal means of communication which potentially can express universal ideas more effectively than their predecessors. Uh, okay, the New World uh, uh, Pan-Africanists. In the first half of the 20th century, uh, the international drive to restore their land to Africans sustained the most inclusive political movement uh, in the world at the time. And it brought together Africans with uh, descendants of slaves taken to the New World. I'm going to look at three uh, books uh, produced by Pan-Africanist intellectuals. The first is the American W.E.B. Du Bois the souls of black folk. And his slogan in this book is that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Uh, in other words, racism, uh, not just in uh, European empire, but even more uh, 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 perhaps in the United States, uh, is the prime uh, problem facing any attempt to move society forward. And his focus in this book 
is on uh, the idea of soul. Uh, I mean, he claims, and I think it's reasonable, that, that America was a very robust society in uh, the 19th century, but it didn't produce anything beautiful except uh, the uh, spiritual uh, uh, music of uh, the Negro slaves. Um, so one of the things that he's, he's, he's doing in this book is trying to persuade his predominantly white readers to recognize the humanity of black slaves as being, or former slaves, as being manifested uh, in uh, uh, the soul of their cultural production. What he means by soul is, first of all, the non-material, immortal part that each of us has, Second, uh, the core, integral, most vital part. And thirdly, the sensitive feeling aspect of uh, human personality. So for uh, uh, Du Bois was both individual and collective and even shared by humanity as a whole. And one of the reasons that I'm interested in the idea of soul uh, and indeed in one, you know, the, the great soul, um, is because it's a concept, a metaphysical concept uh, uh, that provides means of uh, conceiving of what uh, individuals and collectivities and even humanity as a whole uh, have in common. Uh, one of the other main ideas that he presents is the idea of the veil which is that black people uh, want to be encountered as themselves, but in fact are usually encountered only uh, as black. And so there's a, a, the veil is this uh, uh, thing that prevents black people from being realized in society as uh, proper human beings. And he uh, is writing this book, he says, you know, through and across and above the veil. The veil is also an opportunity. If people don't see you as you are, that means you have a chance to uh, 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 present yourself in more creative ways. He also developed the idea of double consciousness. That is, that black people all see themselves as human beings and would like to be recognized as citizens of the United States, which officially they were, uh, but they were always uh, 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 conceived of uh, uh, as black, and so they were, their consciousness of themselves was uh, permanently divided in this way. Uh, I haven't really got the time to develop it, but one of my favorite passages is from 1 Corinthians 13, which is the famous uh, a uh, passage where Paul writes about faith, hope, and charity, and talks about uh, 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 how we see the world through a glass darkly, which is through some kind of cracked mirror of race that prevents us from seeing ourselves and others um, as they are. I think what uh, um, uh, uh, du Bois is uh, uh, developing here uh, has very strong resonance uh, with that. Uh, now we get back at last <laughs> to uh, Mohandas K. Gandhi. Uh, I wanted to talk very briefly about two uh, aspects of uh, Gandhi's work that uh, appeal to me. First of all, uh, as Bhikkhu Parekh, I think, is among others, uh, brought to the fore, I mean, Gandhi had a devastating critique of the modern state. He said the purpose of a civilization should be to uh, uh, help its members uh, realize themselves, uh, whereas the point of the modern state is to disable um, its citizens so that we are subjected to the power of uh, uh, professional experts, uh, we're patients, we're students, we're taxpayers, and in the extreme, we're prisoners, which for him was uh, quite practically uh, one of the main sites of uh, the power of uh, 
the modern state. I mean, the United States, in case you didn't know, uh, actually has today 25% of the world's prisoners, and most of them are black. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, the, the antidote uh, to this vision of the modern state uh, was the development of self-rule, both home rule for uh, uh, Indians uh, more generally, but also self-realization at uh, the personal level and many levels uh, in between. And as you all know, it, it meant that his... Uh, 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 his, 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 his essential political strategy was one of decentralization, which, of course, was not, in the end, uh, how the uh, uh, anti-colonial struggle went in India. Also, I mean, uh, 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 so that's Swaraj, and uh, of course, the means of achieving self-rule is what he calls insistence on truth, Satyagraha. Uh, so one of the main uh, elements that I have developed very weakly here, but uh, I mean, what interests me is the degree to which uh, emancipation can be pursued through secular politics alone, and the degree to which religion uh, is a necessary component of mobilizing people for emancipation. And, uh, uh, one of the issues, which I'm sure you're all aware of, is to what extent was Gandhi a religious figure, uh, and that, that some people would argue, and they do argue, that this diverted him from uh, uh, developing a more effective uh, political strategy. Uh, one of the things that I am interested in and, and, and cannot develop here is that the Pan-Africanists, hey, I must have missed I missed uh, uh, C.L.R. James and... Uh, <laughs> how did that happen? Um, I skipped a slide. Uh, uh, two slides? No, just one. Uh, Fanon is, is on the same slide. Okay, James, I've already mentioned. Uh, I mean, James uh, was a sports writer uh, and, uh, and writer of fiction who came to London from the wet Caribbean in the uh, early 30s and went through an amazing uh, less than a decade in which he produced the first Caribbean novel of urban lowlife, uh, wrote the first Trotsky's history uh, of world politics, uh, wrote a, a, a ghosted a, a, a cricket biography of Leary Constantine, produced a play about Toussaint Louverture, the leader of the Haitian Revolution, uh, starring Paul Robeson, uh, uh, and at the end of it all, uh, produced uh, the history of the Haitian Revolution, the slave revolt uh, 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 in Saint-Domingue, in a book called The Black Jacobins, which is a classic. And he also published at the same time uh, a, a small uh, book uh, examining the history of Negro Revolution on both sides of the Atlantic over a period of two centuries. Uh, and what he believed was, I mean, the Haitian Revolution, uh, which was a close contemporary of the American and the French revolutions, uh, had virtually disappeared from history. And he tried to uh, argue and develop the idea that, um, uh, uh, that the Haitian Revolution mattered to world history. And indeed, his book uh, put it back uh, on the map. Uh, I mean, it was the only slave revolution in history that succeeded. And all the powers of the day sent large armies that, uh, and all of which were defeated. The British sent 50,000, uh, an army of 50,000 people, which was the largest expeditionary force in their history, and not one of them survived. And it set back the Napoleonic Wars for five years because it took them an extra five years to raise that army and launch it 
uh, through the Peninsula War. So it's, uh, he, he, and, and he writes with tremendous verve and uh, uh, clarity. Uh, so his basic idea uh, was that um, the Haitian Revolution uh, provided inspiration for and precedent for uh, uh, anti-colonial revolution in the present time. Um, and he had, a, he was, as I've mentioned, a, a Trotskyist, and he had a, a, a strong Trotskyist vision of world history that uh, uh, developments in one part of the world uh, affect others and should not be conceived of too narrowly in uh, terms of political uh, boundaries. And in his book, uh, The History of Negro Revolt, I mean, he, he made his case for imminent African revolution based on the fact that what the Haitian Revolution combined was a terrible and intimidating form of racism combined with the most advanced uh, capitalist mode of production on the planet, highly mechanized uh, 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 sugar plantations. And he was saying this combination of advanced modern production and racist uh, domination uh, was uh, potentially revolutionary. Uh, he saw the same thing occurring in Africa in the period between the wars and claimed that uh, the collapse of uh, empire there was imminent. Nobody, nobody believed that then. This is 1938, but of course, after the Second World War, uh, the whole thing came down like a pack of cards. Franz Fanon was a Martinican psychiatrist who produced his book The Wretched of the Earth in 1961 and died in the same year from cancer. It had a preface from Sartre. I mean, the thing about uh, 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 Fanon is that he is he was recognized to be advocating violent war against colonial rule. He said, you know, there's no way we're going to get these people out without fighting them. In other words, kill Whitey. So he, uh, and Sartre produces a preface in Paris trying to persuade his French readers that they will be um, uh, uh, enlightened by reading a book that was about killing white people. Uh, it was pretty uh, uh, dramatic then. But this image uh, of the book that uh, it's uh, 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 this emphasis on, on, on violence, which is the opening chapter, is counteracted by the last chapter, which is called Colonial War and Mental Disorders, and draws on his, practition, his practice as a uh, a working psychiatrist in Algeria, and what he shows is he has, you know, twelve-year-old Algerian boys who who have cracked up because they kill a European peer. He has uh, young French squaddies who have lost their mind because they can't deal with the torture that they inflicted on insurgents. So what he's developing here is the notion that extreme violence is incompatible with our humanity. And it's not just the victims, but also the victimizers are transformed by it. So it's a more uh, complicated message. Uh, he also has extraordinary insight into uh, the future of nationalism uh, after the uh, anti-colonial revolution. Uh, for all these three people, uh, the cultural re legacy of Western... I mean, these people were not against Western civilization. They hoped to draw on it and turn it to their own uh, advantage. It remained for them a universal human resource. Uh, they felt that they had absorbed its fruits by growing up on the inside. I mean, these West Indians thought they were in a privileged position relative to Africans because many Africans grew up in an African setting. You know, it's, it's a debatable position, but it's the one that they had. 
But what, at the same time, they believe that their experience of colonial racism and resistance to it allowed them to develop a more uh, 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 inclusive humanism and global vision and to go beyond the Europeans whose empire had launched uh, uh, world society in the previous uh, century. Okay, uh, uh, to go back to Gandhi, uh, did Gandhi's thought, uh, uh, can it be described as being in any way an anthropology in the sense that I outlined earlier? I mean, as far as I can see, Gandhi believed that uh, humanity is based on two universal postulates. Every human being is a unique personality, and each of us also participates with the rest of humanity in an encompassing whole. So the question is, how do you connect this unique uh, human personality with the whole humanity that we, we're supposed to be uh, part of? And he, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, believed that between these two extremes there were a great variety of social divisions. And he put some effort into asking, well, which uh, level of social division is appropriate for uh, the Indian political revolution? And he settles on the village as the most appropriate social vehicle uh, for development. I mean, apart from the importance of agriculture in production for many, it was also a scale of society that was more appropriate for uh, uh, people to live in. I mean, when he went to London in uh, the early 30s, I mean, he couldn't believe the condition uh, in which uh, uh, the English working class lived in places like the East End of London. And he said, you know, no Indian peasant would put up with this. You know, but the uh, English working class were persuaded that they were superior to the rest of the world while uh, suffering from these appalling conditions. Uh, so the question that I ask uh, 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 is how can we bridge the gap between a self that we often conceive of as being puny and vulnerable in the extreme and the vast universe of which we are a part and on which we depend? And the answer to that question is you have to do two things. You have to scale the world down and you have to scale the self up uh, so that they can enter into some meaningful relationship. I mean, one way traditionally that people did this was by praying to God. You know, a man in his bedroom you know, has a personal conversation with a, a large and imposing figure with a white beard. Uh, but at least, uh, you know, this notion is a way of bringing the most inclusive sense of what we're part of uh, into a meaningful personal relationship. Now, uh, Gandhi brought an eclectic mix of intellectual traditions to the search for answers to this question. Uh, I just, uh, I haven't got time to develop it, but I would argue that uh, two of the most important uh, influences were Victorian Romanticism, that's well known, but also I'm exploring uh, the notion that uh, his Porbandar associates uh, may well have exposed him to a certain line in Buddhist economics, and of course he was very keen to engage with, uh, integrate, uh, and construct uh, Hindu society. Now his autobiography uh, is full of examples of how he sought to uh, insert himself as an ordinary person into larger uh, political processes uh, and with some effectiveness. Uh, and he sought to develop the means of doing this in ways that others might learn from. One example that I like is he goes to London to learn the law and he can't find any food he likes to eat. Uh, no vegetarian restaurant, so he joins the Vegetarian Association gets on the committee and by the time he leaves there are 20 vegetarian restaurants in London. I mean, not many of us have that, that scope of, well, I don't know what to eat, well, okay, I'll just change the map of London eating. 
Uh, another one is an, an example after he returned to India in 1924, uh, when he went, there was a big strike in Ahmedabad, and Gandhi turned up uh, two days into the strike and just sat on the street corner, and within 24 hours, the whole political dynamic of the strike revolved around him. Now this, 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 uh, the, 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 as I said, the book is full of this stuff, uh, and, and I think it's worth being analytical about it. How do you do that? Uh, and indeed, his whole life, as he uh, made clear, uh, was a self-directed attempt to achieve it. As I've already indicated, traditionally, religion was the way in which we combined uh, intimate subjectivity and engagement with the world together in a meaningful way, including perhaps uh, by prayer. Well, I, I, I mean, I ask myself, I mean, how in the modern world, in the last two centuries since the industrialization, how have people gone about uh, bridging the gap between themselves as an independent subject and the world in which they live? And I, I think the fiction, novels, plays, and movies, you know, uh, scale the world down to a screen or a paperback, uh, each of us then enters it uh, with subjective freedom to imagine our relationship to it. And anyway, uh, this uh, is something that uh, uh, is a work in progress. Uh, finally, uh, what I believe is that we you know, I mean, you can, I mean, okay, uh, most people live in a world in which they are divided by identity politics and they see other people through uh, uh, identity stereotypes and to some extent it brings out the worst in them. Uh, this is, you might say, idealistic, but I think we, uh, especially in a world of uh, great movement, that what we should be looking for uh, in the way of stable order uh, is to establish uh, meaningful relationships between the two extremes of our experience, between the least uh, 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 inclusive, which is, you know, us brushing our teeth, and uh, the most inclusive level of human existence. And that this is a matter of some priority to try and figure out at least philosophically, like Kant, uh, some of the means that one might uh, take uh, to do that. But I still argue that that St. Paul in, in, in Corinthians is, is essential when he compares the world as we experience it and how it ought to be, uh, he's making the same point, uh, which is another reason for thinking more seriously about how we connect with these more inclusive visions. Each of us embarks on a journey out into the world and into the self. Uh, so it's neither the world out there nor how each of us imagines it. The synthesis we seek is something I would call self in the world. That is, how do we combine uh, our outward journey with uh, our uh, inner subjective development? And Kant sought to unite the two, uh, uh, conceiving of us, each of us, as subjective individuals who nevertheless uh, share the object world with the rest of humanity. I mean, he was a scientist also, and he recognized that so there were limits to uh, subjective individualism, that we have to base uh, our uh, subjective aspirations on uh, grasping the objective terms under which we inhabit uh, this planet. Uh, uh, Professor Bose uh, mentioned, and this is a, 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 a kind of slogan taken from my money book. Um, what I argue, the money book is not just about money, it's about how the communications revolution is changing our experience of money and uh, uh, exchange. And uh, I argue that the exchange of meanings through language and of goods through money are now converging in a single network of communications 
the internet. So, I mean, again, I mean, I don't want to separate the kind of discussion that I've been involved in this evening from what I consider to be absolutely crucial to it, which is discovering how to use this digital revolution uh, to advance the human conversation about a better world in more uh, creative and constructive ways than we tend to at present. I have a, uh, I mean, for a lot of people, especially academics, the, the idea of being actively engaged in uh, such a technological revolution is not very appealing. And to them, I, uh, I have a quote from Oswald Spengler in his book, uh, The Decline of the West. It says, the world historical moment you're born into does not need you. It will carry on with or without you. But do you have the courage to embrace that moment? You can engage with the revolution or hide from it. Uh, so, uh, 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 what I mean, obviously, what I haven't developed here is how uh, the contradictions of our world uh, relate to the contradictions of the world that the anti-colonial intellectuals responded to and transformed. But I think it does mean uh, identifying what are the important uh, trends within it and engaging with them practically and actively. Uh, so, roughly speaking, what I've been trying to argue today is that the cosmopolitan tradition in anthropology, which uh, Kant uh, pioneered, uh, flourished uh, rather unexpectedly in the work of the anti-colonial uh, intellectuals like Du Bois, uh, James and Fanon. And what they set out to do was to build a world civilization fit for all of humanity and certainly more fit than the one they had inherited in the former colonial empire. Uh, I know that I haven't uh, uh, said enough tonight uh, because it's really a lifetime's vocation beginning now. Uh, but none of these anti-colonial intellectuals, in my view, was greater than Gandhi, uh, nor has more to contribute uh, to that cosmopolitan tradition. I think that's it. just world society in their uh, own ways. I think what you have offered us is a um, new reading of Kant um, by focusing on his contributions to anthropology. There are of course many Kantians in the world today, many philosophers who believe that they are legacies of Kant, who tend to hold the view that uh, somehow cosmopolitanism is incompatible with patriotism or anti-colonialism. Uh, cosmopolitanism, in their view, Kant argued, can derive only from abstract reason. And patriotism uh, might be very sort of seductive, uh, but uh, ultimately it misleads. Uh, now, um, so these are the votaries of colorless cosmopolitanism and who would say that colorful patriotism is the exact opposite which must be eschewed. On the other hand, uh, we do have a philosophical uh, tradition, uh, not least in India and among Indian philosophers, uh, which suggests that in fact uh, cosmopolitanism and patriotism may well be compatible. There can be a form of cosmopolitanism that can derive from local and regional learning, languages, literatures, morals. And I think what you have shown is that it's possible to reconcile Kant's philosophical humanism with you know, Gandhi's philosophical humanism. 
Also quite fascinating was the way in which you placed Gandhian thought in the context of three other very major anti-colonial intellectuals. Now, I think we might extend that discussion a little further um, beyond those whom you have uh, labeled as pan-Africanists. Uh, and it's related to this point that patriotism or nationalism is not necessarily territorially bound. You know, I wrote a section in my book, A Hundred Horizons, uh, on Gandhi in South Africa. And I ended that section by quoting Gandhi where he says, I'm a good sailor. Uh, he suggested that he was comfortable on land and at sea. Uh, he could um, think about love for his homeland, but at the same time, he could transcend the boundaries of his homeland in the search for a common humanity. There are historians of the 20th century who make the mistake of suggesting that, say, the period at the end of the First World War uh, was a Wilsonian moment. Uh, one of my colleagues has written a book suggesting that Wilsonian national self-determination uh, was the defining element about 100 years ago, during and after the First World War. But in fact, if you reflect very carefully, you will find that you know, there were other kinds of internationalisms or universalisms in the age of anti-colonial nationalism, which were far more important than Wilsonian national self-determination. I can think about Asianism, often talked about as pan-Asianism, uh, that had spread from Japan through China and Vietnam to India in the first decade of the 20th century and continued to have a long afterlife all the way to the Asian Relations Conference here in Delhi in April 1947, which Gandhi addressed. I can think of uh, other um, internationalisms, for example, Bolshevik, communist internationalism. And I have to say that, say, around 1919 to the early 1920s, Lenin certainly would have won any contest for anti-colonial hearts and minds uh, over Wilson. But there were also a number of religiously tinged universalisms. Uh, Buddhist universalism, uh, Islamic universalism, even forms of Hindu universalism of the Vivekananda type. And you cannot conceive of Sri Lankan or Thai or Burmese anti-colonial nationalism without taking into account the relationship of that anti-colonial nationalism with Buddhistic universalism. Similarly, consider Mahatma Gandhi's first mass movement, All India Mass Movement in India, after Ahmedabad, after Khera, after Champaran. There, he fused the non-cooperation movement with the Khilafat movement. So what was he doing? He was bringing together the strands of Indian territorial nationalism with an anti-colonial sentiment lodged in Islamic universalism. And he was absolutely clear when he wrote in his journal Young India in that period that there was nothing wrong with an extraterritorial loyalty. As he put it, you know, Hindus should not be frightened of pan-Islamism. It is not, it need not be anti-Hindu. And what he also said, and this is where Kant comes back in, that he was not supporting just um, religious sentiment. Uh, he suggested that the Khilafat claim was just and reasonable. And on top of that, it was supported by scriptural authority. So many years ago in 1997, giving the Trevelyan Lecture in Cambridge, uh, I actually had a sec section in my lecture called Gandhi's Reason. And I argued against uh, scholars like Ashish Nandi or Partha Chatterjee, who believed that Gandhi's thought stood completely outside the rationalist historicist discourse of his contemporaries. I suggested that you could, in fact, identify Gandhi's reason when he is critiquing Lloyd George's uh, false promises of British perfidy in general and so forth. But what is more important is that he's able to think in terms of territorially based nationalism as not being in contradiction with an extraterritorial anti-colonial sentiment. And again, I'm not 
entirely fond of adding pan before Africanism or is uh, Islamism or Asianism and so forth. Because, you know, pan-Islamism very quickly acquired pejorative connotations in the colonial discourse. And that's why Iqbal used to say, why Islamism is enough. Why add the prefix pan? Uh, and, and it is not uh, something that is opposed to territorially based nationalism, the freedom of homelands, the freedom of specific countries from colonial rule. So I think that this discussion that, uh, that Professor Hart has introduced, uh, placing Gandhi in the context of quote unquote pan Africanist thinkers, and he's discussed sort of three of them, uh, can be extended to think in terms of Gandhi's thought as it, as it related to other kinds of universalisms. Now, Gandhi, of course, was a critique of the modern state, and Professor Hart has cited uh, Bhikkhu Parikh's work. Uh, what I would say, however, is that, um, you know, sometimes there's a lot of overemphasis on one Gandhi text. This is Hind Swaraj, which he wrote originally in Gujarati, and then it was translated into many languages, including English, in 1989 in South Africa. Now, that is a thoroughgoing critique. Uh, of the modern state, but also modern industrial civilization as a whole. But I think it's equally important for students uh, to read Gandhi writing in Young India uh, between uh, in the early 1920s. It is extremely important to read Gandhi writing in Harijan in the 1930s and then again in the 1940s, particularly his wonderful articles in Harijan in 1946-1947. And there's a very interesting letter that Mahatma Gandhi wrote to Jawaharlal Nehru, I believe in 1946, just before independence, where, you know, Nehru, Gandhi is saying that, you know, Nehru has said that, you know, what you wrote in Hind Swaraj doesn't really make much sense. Uh, and Gandhi says that I don't have Hind Swaraj in front of me. And of course, there he had written that, you know, the railways and post offices and doctors and lawyers, all this should go, and we should all return to living the life of a simple peasant in a hut in the village. And he did valorize the village. But he said, what he said to Nehru was very interesting. He said that, uh, you know, post offices and railways can stay at that point, he's saying. Uh, but, you know, we have to actually discover the real article in the villages, and then the large scale picture will fall into place. So that was the position that he was taking, which I think was quite a sophisticated position. And what I would like to add that perhaps Gandhi believed in a somewhat extreme form of you know, atomism and thinking about the village. But there were a whole range of anti-colonial thinkers of that period, part of India's anti-colonial revolution. And I myself wrote an essay based on Aurobindo's thought some years ago, which was published in Modern Intellectual History. But there are many more. And what I would say, is that all of them were thinking of a state of union forged from below, which was very different from the strong centralized state that Nehru and Patel finally inherited in 1947. And I think not just Gandhi, but the ideas of a whole range of other early 20th century thinkers are very relevant as we try to build a new kind of you know, a state uh, that is not oppressive, uh, and, you know, does not stifle, uh, stifle difference. A final point, um, you know, uh, Professor Hart um, broached this question, uh, was Gandhi uh, a religious figure? And he alluded to uh, Perry Anderson's uh, sharp critique of Gandhi in his long London review of books, uh, Peace. Um, and uh, while I agree with some of what Perry Anderson has to say about the inheritance of the strong centralized state of the British Raj by mainstream Indian nationalism in 1947, I think he misinterprets Gandhi quite badly. And uh, what we need to understand that um, Gandhi did not believe in a complete separation of religion and politics. Sometimes in a good intentioned way, these days we also want to dub Gandhi as secular. But what Gandhi was against eventually was religious prejudice, religious bigotry, hatred of people belonging to other religious communities. 
but he always accepted religion and honor as a motive for struggle. So when he was working during the non-cooperation movement with his great compatriots, Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali, he was saying that Swaraj is important for us both uh, because only then will the safety of our respective faiths be possible. So even Swaraj or a struggle for independence could be a means to a religious end. It wasn't just that he was using religion for nationalist uh, ends. But the other thing that's extremely important to remember about Gandhi, and this here I speak as a historian, Gandhi was constantly learning throughout his life. And therefore, you know, for example, during the non-cooperation movement, he forged Hindu-Muslim unity in the political sphere. Um, yet, he would not sit down and dine with his closest political comrades, Shaukat Ali and Muhammad Ali. Because he said, and he was, could be very funny about it, this kind of thing, he said that eating is like the other privately performed sanitary practices of life. <laughs> and I'm sure the Ali brothers, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, will tolerate my bigotry if my self-denial is so named, that I'm denying myself the pleasure of sitting and dining sort of with them. In that period, he was also not necessarily in favor of intermarriage. But later in life, you read him in the 1940s, he only attends inter-caste and inter-religious community marriages. He is asked point blank in Noakhali, what do you think about marriages between people of different religious communities? He says it is a welcome event, and this kind of a marriage should be based on mutual friendship and respect. Um, and then, you know, in Delhi, in I think it was in April 1946 that he visits the prisoners of the Indian National Army in the Red Fort. And these soldiers tell Gandhi that, uh, you know, um, when we were fighting under the leadership of Netaji Shubhashan Rabos, we had no differences along lines of creed or religion. And here the British serve us separate Hindu tea and Muslim tea. So Gandhi says that, but why do you suffer it? And the soldiers replied, we don't. We mix Hindu tea and Muslim tea half and half and then serve the same with food. So Gandhi laughed, Tenuta records this conversation and said that is very, very good. Now look at, see how far he has moved from the period when he would not sit down and dine with Muhammad Ali and, and Shaukat Ali. And he is encouraging his followers, including Manu Gandhi, to go and you know, sit down and share the food with people of our all castes and communities. So even in, in that respect, he was becoming in some sense more of a cosmopolitan over a period of, a period of, uh, of time. So finally, I think that uh, what Professor Keith Hart has uh, done for us is to actually show Gandhi, and the crux of his argument about Gandhi, of course, is that he showed himself and he showed others how to scale the self up and scale the world down. And, and that is how he established this intrinsic link between our own morals, which are located in ourselves, and sort of a larger ethical conception of a world society or, or world affairs. And um, I will just read two sentences from the written version of uh, Professor Hart's uh, lecture, uh, which he did not read himself, which I think really captures uh, the, uh, his argument, but also you know, what we should be working for today. And here, 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 here it is in the second last paragraph of the written version. Old versions of the human universal suppressed the particulars that constitute human experience. I mean, this was, of course, the false universalist claim of European imperialism. You know, they were claiming that they had a monopoly on universalism. The new universal must grant that it can only be realized through those particulars. That is what I think, you know, great anti-colonial thinkers like Gandhi were suggesting that we can respect differences 
and yet transcend them to build a just global society that, that values a sense of egalitarianism, even if we are not able to wipe out all of the inequities that we uh, that us. So thank you very much, I think. between universals and particulars and, and how we can think uh, through that. I mean, I mean, my definition of great literature is uh, uh, that it takes us into propositions of great generality by going deeply into local places and times and, and personalities. Uh, so for me, great literature is the model for what we're uh, uh, aiming for. Which it's also our best demonstration uh, of that. Uh, I was um, uh, very impressed by you uh, uh, starting from uh, cosmopolitanism and patriotism, uh, because uh, those who speak about you know, a viable world uh, will, and this include me, uh, are likely to point to the national fragmentation of society as the kind of problem that, that has to be overcome. And uh, indeed, I, I do. I mean, I write at length about uh, the notion of what I call national capitalism being in a period of collapse and of, uh, leaving the world circuit of money uh, in a lawless condition. But um, I mean, I too would like to be uh, a patriot. Uh, I define it slightly different. People say to me, uh, you English, and I say, I'm not English, I'm from Manchester. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 uh, uh, I call a patriot somebody who loves where he comes from. Uh, and it need not take a, a national form. And, Given the benighted history that I was born into, I, I think you would uh, sympathize with my wish not to identify myself as English or British or anything to do with that corrupt London state. Uh, I, 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 I don't live in, in, in England. Uh, I live in France <coughs> and South Africa. I can't uh, bear to be in England, actually. Uh, so, uh, yes, I mean, uh, uh, one of the, the very strong features of Fanon's Wretched of the Earth is that uh, he, he did take a, a pan-Africanist position, which was particularly important in the context of the Algerian War. But then, talking about post-colonial society, uh, he went out of his way to to, to redeem the, the, the national imperative and to, and to argue that they, it should not be seen as uh, uh, contradicting uh, the desire for all Africans to work together. So, uh, I, 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 and I too, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, I worked in Ghana uh, for my PhD 40, 50 years ago. And, and almost everything that I saw there in, in the context of nation building is now called globalization. You know, I mean, it takes place on a, a different scale and perhaps across more uh, boundaries. But the, the formation of uh, modern nations is, is very similar to uh, the idea of making a viable world society. And, uh, and I therefore should be part of constructing, constructive thinking about it. The question of Pan-Africanism is not one that I choose. Uh, 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 the period from 1900 to 1950 until the Pan-Africanist conference in Manchester of 1945 
I mean, what, what made this movement remarkable was that um, um, the Africans from all the colonial uh, traditions living in France and Britain and Portugal and Brazil and the United States uh, somehow found the means of developing a common political cause uh, with uh, uh, indigenous Africans who had not yet moved. And uh, you know, Du Bois uh, uh, was, uh, uh, I mean, one of the organizers of the Pan African Congress. Uh, I mean, he you know, chose with Nkrumah, who he followed, uh, to label himself in later life as a, a Pan Africanist. I mean, there, there, there are many versions of that, including Marcus Garvey, for example, that one would run a mile from, and definitely not. Uh, but, uh, but I think the idea, I mean, I'm interested in the idea now because I'm writing a book about African development in the 21st century, which is about the prospects for political and trade integration, if not in the region as a whole, then more broadly uh, than at present. So uh, 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 I follow that uh, uh, line. But uh, I was so thrilled by your um, exploration of, of, of the, the dialectical nature of, of of Gandhi's development, which of course is far more true and, and revealing than any attempt to pigeonhole him at one end of, uh, of several dialectical uh, pairs. And in fact, I was greatly inspired by what you had to say. Uh, but I think the fundamental point is this, you know, that if we want to be uh, uh, recognized for who we are, each of us, you know, then, uh, uh, you know, we, we have to find ways, you know, past uh, 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 the blockages that prevent us from uh, uh, being that. I mean, the, the reason why I started with The Souls of Black, with Black Folk, which is a beautiful book. I mean, it's an incredible book. It's 15 essays, very different. I mean, ranging from a polemic against Booker T. Washington, the leading black politician of the day, to a study of Georgia sharecroppers, to a, a really moving description of the loss of his own two-year-old child, uh, who actually had blue eyes and, and, uh, and, and golden hair. And, and he, you know, it, 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 I mean, every chapter is preceded by an excerpt from a Negro spiritual, which he calls the Sorrow Songs. And, you know, the, 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 the level of writing and engagement is, is uh, uh, quite extraordinary. But, I mean, even though he, he saw, and in the end, retreated from the desire to engage with non-blacks with non in, uh, in, in America, I mean, it's... I think he clearly uh, lost out as a result of that and ended up in a much in a sort of uh, dead end politically and philosophically. And you know, we have to resist uh, the temptation to conceive of local identities in all their manifestation as an obstacle to realizing our aspiration to universality. So I couldn't. Agree more. I'm sorry it wasn't very contentious, but uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, professors. Uh, let's uh, bring this session to a close. Uh, can I invite my colleague Malika Sharkia to offer a vote of thanks, please? but I'll try. Um, it's an honor really to listen to Professor Keith Hart and even bigger of an honor to be invited to um, give a vote of thanks. But it's actually not an easy task. Um, when I was leaving South Africa after working on Professor Keith Hart's um, Human Economy Project just exactly two years ago, I, had, I made one attempt to thank him and he gave me a look for uh, my calling him a guru. 
Um, this is my second attempt, and um, I'm sorry, Keith, but I'm going to call you my good friend. Uh, in accepting SAU social sciences uh, invitation that you did, and my humble request to deliver this lecture. Um, so I know there's this kind of spatial notion of teacherliness, um, but I would like you to know that there's also this very spirited notion uh, of guru in Nepal, where I come from, where the word uh, could be used, for example, by a bus cleaner to refer to his bus boss um, in kind of being friends and taking this locomotive forward together and also sharing a tara drink and coping with the chaos of customers in the taxi companies. So somewhere between these two versions, I hope that we can agree on one version of meaning that is acceptable to both of us. Um, when I joined the uh, Human Economy Program uh, in University of Pretoria, I was curious about this other project that you mentioned that you've been working on, on Gandhi. And today as this lecture comes to fruition, I'm thinking that that is not actually this other project, but in many ways, uh, an extension of uh, the idea of human economy itself in anthropologizing the question of revolution and extending this notion from colonialism of last century to a new phase of hegemonic neocolonialism of today, which takes its power from suppressing the particulars and the human ethos to legitimize the abstract model that is difficult for us to relate to that which empowers us and subjugates us. You invoked Gandhi as the guru who showed us the world, um, the possibilities of, as Professor Sugudapal also says, the scaling the world down and the self up in invoking the morality to enable the individuals and make personal judgments about the good and the bad at all levels ranging from household to society to nation to the world. I'm very much hoping that um, this conversation uh, is carried forward in our classrooms um, and common rooms, but beyond Salvation University in Delhi to Salvation in general as well. Um, and I must thank Professor Suga de Vos for agreeing to chair this program, and in fact being a true host in welcoming a scholar of Gandhi from abroad to the land of Gandhi. I also thank him for coming out to engage with the community of Salvation scholars and students who are congregated to Delhi to pursue the intellectual meaning and practice of being Salvation. Um, and I thank uh, Dr. Kavita Sarma, uh, the president of Salvation University, for her support in making this event a possibility. Dr. A.K. Malik, the registrar of SAU, and his staff um, for their support. Professor Sashanka Parida and Dr. Ravi Kumar, um, my dean and my chair, for providing overall guidance. And Samson George, um, Jyoti Chawla, and Aman Kumar Singh for providing the administrative and logistical support. Uh, Dr. Vidit Gildial and uh, Aslam Ansari, and the entire IT team, without whose help, this event would not have been possible. Um, and our MPhil and PhD candidates uh, from the Department of Sociology, Kumud Manshali, who introduced, uh, who began the session, um, Meghna Srivastav and Srimal Fernando for their um, much needed support at various parts of preparation of this event, and the entire organizing committee comprised of the MA students, um, starting with Sandhya Menon, but also others, uh, Mustafi Skalyan, uh, Venkata, Nikhar, Rashmi, Apurva, Ashrati, Satyandan, Fatima, Dipankar, Jyotika, and Ratan, and many more who came on board to help with the emergency at times. And I thank Ms. Anoli Pereira for designing the poster and invitation cards. And above all, I thank all of you for coming out here to make this event a success. And because of the time limit and shortness, uh, we don't have a formal Q&A session, but I understand from all the scholars and those of us who are here that we will be around and we invite you to kind of approach us or be, make us part of the informal conversation on any questions you might have or any comments you'd like to convey. Um, with this, um, thank you all.